Let the word go forth from this time and place to friend and foe alike. This is preeminently the time to speak the truth, the whole truth, frankly and boldly. History doesn't have to be boring, buttoned up, or inaccessible. And it certainly didn't end in 1945. It belongs to all of us, and we share and add to it every day. Welcome to the History of Go-Go podcast, where I interview interesting guests, cover a motley crew of topics, and it's a place where you can sit, think, and drink all at the same time. I'm your host, Rob Mellon. Just getting out of bed To face all the chores ahead Till that aroma comes through When the folder starts to brew The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. Folgers is mountain-grown coffee, and the rich aroma of mountain-grown beans makes Folgers one coffee made with the morning in mind. Now things are feeling right. You see the morning in a whole new light. There's hard work to be done. Another day yet to be won. The best part of waking up is Folgers in your cup. My guest today is writer and researcher Mark Pendergrast. He began writing full-time in 1991, and today his books have been published in 15 languages. For God, Country, and Coca-Cola was named a notable book of the year by the New York Times, and Discovery Magazine chose Mirror Mirror as one of the top science books of the year. He has appeared on dozens of television programs, including The Today Show, CBS This Morning, and on CNN, and has been interviewed on over 100 radio shows, including All Things Considered, Marketplace, and many, many others. His book, Uncommon Grounds, The History of Coffee and How It Transformed Our World, takes you through the amazing impact of that simple bean from its discovery on an ancient Ethiopian hillside to the modern age of Starbucks. And that will be our topic of discussion today. Of Uncommon Grounds, the New York Times book review states, With wit and humor, Pendergrast has served up a rich blend of anecdote, character study, market analysis, and social history. And we are very pleased to have the prolific writer, and researcher with us today. Welcome, Mr. Pendergrast. Hello, Rob. Thanks for having me. So I know you're a very prolific writer, but what got you interested in researching coffee? Were you an avid coffee drinker from a young man? Actually, no, I wasn't. I was interested in coffee because it was the kind of story that I had told about Coca-Cola. I had written a book called For God, Country, and Coca-Cola. And what was interesting about that was that it covered so many different areas through a fairly narrow lens of a, of a you know, little mean Coke bottle, including world politics and controversies over health and marketing and how it developed. And so I was interested in coffee from the point of view of something that meant a lot to people, but that didn't, in fact, really, you know, if everybody couldn't get coffee tomorrow, they would probably have a major headache and maybe a real withdrawal symptom. But after that, I mean, it basically isn't the end of the world. And the same thing is true of the sugar-flavored soda drink. So I was looking at it from a historical point of view primarily. But then as I began to research it and the passionate people who care so much about coffee, and they kept giving me all this really good stuff. So I became kind of a coffee snob in reverse. <laughs> it became something that I was quite interested in, and now I, I drink coffee every, every morning. Mark, it is tradition here to accompany the conversation with a special brew. Today, we have Maple Breakfast Stout from the 14th Star Brewing Company of St. Albans, Vermont, Maple City, USA. It's an oatmeal stout brewed with real Vermont maple syrup and cold brew coffee, which is perfect for our talk today. This 14th Star Brewery stout has flavors and aromas of dark malts, coffee, and maple, and it's available year-round. 
So if you find yourself in Maple City, USA, head on over to the 14th Star Brewing Company and try Maple Breakfast Stout. Remember, the best way to enjoy the podcast is with one of our featured brews. And this is also my opportunity to ask you to subscribe to the podcast. Subscribing is the only way to get those new shows right away. And to all of the listeners and supporters from 60 countries and hundreds of cities across the United States, I have to say thank you. And now I raise my maple breakfast stout very high into that simple little bean that has transformed our world, I have to say, cheers. I believe coffee came from a small tree, and you can correct me if I'm wrong. So where did it come from? What's its origins? And where did it grow naturally? Well, there's different forms of coffee, but the one that has become the world's best known and the most popular, about three quarters of the world's coffee, is called Arabica. And that originated in Ethiopia, which was then called Abyssinia. And we're not quite sure when people discovered it. I argue in my book that it's most likely that the tribes had discovered that it had something in it that gave them energy. And so they probably ground up the coffee beans and put them with fat and used it for a quick pick-me-up. But that's arguable. I mean, it may have been mentioned by Arabs as early as 1000 AD, but it's very likely that nobody really thought to make coffee the way that we know it until the late 15th century, the late 1400s. Hypothesized that somebody must have roasted the coffee by accident, that somehow or other they spilled it into a fire and it smelled good. And then they started to roast it on sort of big wok kind of things, which is how they do it in Ethiopia now, and ground it and put it in hot water. There's this myth about a goat herd named Kaldi having discovered it because he was tending his goats on a mountainside, and they started acting really weird and jumping up and butting each other and generally being strange and energetic. And so he looked, and they were eating the berries from this understory tree and also the leaves. And so he tried it himself. And the coffee cherry, as they call it, the berry, is a little red fruit. And the outside of it is actually fairly sweet. And so he probably could have gotten a bit of a high from that. So that's the myth as to how it was discovered. He brought it back. And the monks adopted it as a way, the Sufi monks, uh, as a way to uh, stay awake and alert. But who knows how it really (laughs) developed. It's a nice, appealing story. And there really are wild goats in the mountains of Ethiopia to this day. So there may be something to that myth. Who knows? The interesting thing about the berries is the way that coffee generally grows. Some of the berries ripen and others do not. Can you speak to that? And does that cause any problems in producing the coffee? Well, they all become ripe eventually, but they don't do it at the same time. So it's a problem. You have to keep going back and harvesting the coffee repeatedly, only getting the red berries, or sometimes they're yellow. There's a variety called yellow bourbon. So because it's labor-intensive, that's become an issue with specialty coffee. Whether you know, You have to make sure that people go back and harvested very carefully. When I went to Latin America, I took part in rural Guatemala in a coffee harvesting, and it was humiliating because I was standing on this steep hillside almost falling off it, and this little guy, my caporal, you have a little basket in front of you called a canasta, and he picked, you know, twice as much as I did in the same amount of time. It was was humiliating, (laughs) the picture of me in the book doing that. But anyway, yes, it does have a a big deal to do with the way coffee is harvested. So when it's all stripped at one time, that's bad, and you have to sort out the green beans and you've wasted them, or they get roasted and then it's bad coffee. So that's how that works. Going back to the history of the consumption of coffee, there were several coffee houses in Mecca, and I actually just spent a year in Saudi Arabia. I was in Jeddah, which isn't too far from Mecca, and as a Westerner, I wasn't really even allowed to go to Mecca, so I was never actually in Mecca. I can tell you the Saudis do still enjoy coffee. So what's the history of those early coffee houses in Mecca? Well, 
they were places where people would gather socially and have a good time. They developed sort of a reputation for perhaps having uh, illicit sex in the top room. <laughs> too good of time, yes. Yeah, too good of a time. And also, coffee tends to make you more irreverent. And so they began to write satirical verse about the governor of Mecca, who they did not like very much. His name was Kyer Beg. And he got very upset by this. And so he decided that coffee was like alcohol, which is illegal in the Arab world, as you probably know. Yes. So he banned the coffee houses. And this caused a great deal of tumult and upset. And it didn't last very long. But it was the beginning of many, many tales told that coffee was bad for you and that it was going to stunt your growth uh, or that it would make you impotent or all kinds of other horrible rumors that has plagued coffee ever since. And various coffee houses were shut down over the years by various potentates, including Charles II tried to close down the British coffee houses in the late 1600s, and there probably would have been a rebellion against him. He, he took it back also. You bring up coffee coming to Europe. I think initially, I think the Middle Eastern traders tried to protect their production of coffee. But of course, it does get out. How does it eventually get to Europe and expand from there? Well, you're right. It was They would parboil the beans to make them infertile. They didn't want anybody else to be able to grow them. At that point, it was growing in Ethiopia and also across the Red Sea in Yemen. So that's why the name Mocha was very important early on because that was the port in Yemen. So eventually, an Indian named Baba Budan taped some ripe coffee seeds and smuggled them into India. And similarly, the Dutch got hold of some coffee somehow or other and began to grow it in their greenhouses in Amsterdam. And eventually, they were able to start growing it in Java, which is why that name came to be synonymous with coffee as well. And at that point, it began to be an item of trade. And there were various Europeans who visited the Orient, Middle East, or wherever, and they had coffee. And they reported that it was this black, bitter substance that they weren't quite clear why everybody liked it so much, but they did. And eventually, Probably one of the first places it got to was England. There was an Arab who began to roast coffee around 1650 in Oxford. He started a coffee house there, and eventually it also was in Venice fairly early on because that was a real trade mecca. And you had street vendors who dressed up as Arabs and who were offering coffee on the street. But it really spread like crazy particularly in England early on, before tea became the big drink. There were something like 2,000 coffee houses in London alone by 1700. And it had become a very egalitarian place where they were called penny universities because you could go into a coffee house and learn a lot in a short amount of time. One coffee house might be known as a particularly literary place, so a bunch of newspapers like The Spectator actually began in the coffee houses. Lloyd's Coffee House was where people in the shipping trade went, and that was the origin of Lloyd's of London, the large insurance company. But they didn't let women in in England. In the rest of Europe, they did, but it was not a totally egalitarian thing in England. And that was one of the funnier things I found in the history was that the women of London decided that coffee was making their men impotent hmm. because they would go to the coffee house and then they would go to the tavern and get drunk. Then they would go back to the coffee house to get sober and then they would go back to the tavern and drink some more and then they would go to the coffee house and eventually they would stagger home <laughs> and not be able to perform in bed. And the women were very colorful in their language about this saying that you know, their men came home with nothing moist but their snotty noses, nothing standing but their ears, <laughs> things like that. The men answered this with their own pamphlet, saying that, on the contrary, coffee added a spiritual essence to the sperm and was very good for you. <laughs> <laughs> 
but that was one of the reasons that Charles II was trying to shut them down, was that, that people were beginning to write nasty things about him, satirical verses, etc. So it was a repeat of what had happened in, in Mecca. I was going to ask about that, actually, because once you have conversation, and unlike a bar where you could get inebriated, here you're alert and the conversation could be brisk and it could lead to political conversation, economic conversation. So does those coffee houses have an impact on the revolutions of the world? That's true. You had the French coffee houses by the late 1700s where people were planning the French Revolution in America. It was the tavern and the coffee house where revolution was being planned in Boston. And in America, also, it helped that the Boston Tea Party made tea sort of anathema. They didn't want to support the British East India Company, which had developed by then into a very powerful force, and they were being taxed on it. So by that time, there was coffee being grown or beginning to be grown, and the island of the Caribbean and soon in Brazil. So America became more of a coffee drinker than England did at that point. Anyway, I'm jumping around in time. Oh, no, that's that's fine. It actually leads into a, something I was going to ask you about and how it proliferated in the Caribbean. There was a Frenchman named De Clue in that solo or single coffee tree. Would you discuss the history of De Clue and the single coffee tree and the spread of coffee in the Caribbean? Yeah, and this, you know, there are various people who have pointed out that there may very well have been coffee before this, but the great story is that Gabriel Mathieu de Clou was a Frenchman who had somehow or other gotten a coffee plant from the Dutch, their uh, greenhouses, and he very carefully protected his plant through terrible storms and from jealous British seamen trying to harm his plant, etc. And he brought it over to Martinique, which was a partially French possession at that point. And from that one tree, supposedly most of the coffee in the Western Hemisphere descended. And that's a very romantic story. <laughs> Unfortunately, it also led to one of the ironies in, in coffee history, which is that by the time of the French Revolution, about half of the coffee in the world was being grown on the island of Santo Domingo, which was half French and half Spanish. And the French part is Haiti. So when the Haitians rebelled in 1791, it was after their coffee had fueled the intellect of the French Revolution. <laughs> right. And they were treated horribly. Uh, they were enslaved on the coffee and the sugar plantations. And so in one of the only successful slave revolts in history, the first thing they did was to destroy the coffee plantations and the sugar plantations, which basically led to Haiti being one of the poorest countries in the world for a long, long time, because they also were subjected to all kinds of wars. Napoleon tried to beat them and, and eventually... They underwent a lot of difficult times and, and continue to, to this day. And a lot of it still has to do with coffee because there have been many attempts to get the Haitians to grow coffee. But because it takes four years to grow and because they're so poor and they need fuel for their fires, they tend to cut down the trees before they get anywhere with them. I was going to ask you about the ugly side of coffee production, and you mentioned it already, and, and that is slavery. And the interesting thing is a lot of people think that slavery basically ended in the United States after the, you know, the Emancipation Proclamation and then the 13th Amendment. But the reality is slavery existed, and especially in Brazil, until the late 1880s. That's right. In 1888, the Brazilians finally abolished slavery after everywhere else in the hemisphere, and that was because coffee was so important to Brazil. By that point, Brazil had become the world's largest producer. They didn't call it slavery in places like India or in Guatemala. They did call it slavery in Java and Sumatra, and because of that, they also were terribly oppressed and were starving to death because they weren't fed properly. The Dutch 
had virtually enslaved their coffee plantation workers as well. The British were not much better. And so there's a terrible, terrible history of human oppression in coffee. And it basically continues to this day in one fashion or another. The people who grow coffee don't make as much money as they should. And the ones who are on small farms are particularly prone to the coffee bust cycle where it takes four years for coffee to grow. And so every four to six years, there will be a lot of coffee. The market will crash. People will then stop tending their trees and they won't know what to do and their trees will suffer or sometimes they'll cut them down. They'll stop pruning them. They'll stop fertilizing them. And then eventually the price will go down again and then they'll start growing it again. And this has been going on now for, oh, well over 150 years since coffee became sort of an industrial product in the late 19th century. And people think it's going to stop now because of global warming driving coffee out of business, but it hasn't happened. It keeps occurring that the prices keep going up and then crashing and going up and then crashing. I don't necessarily want to, I don't know if it's fair, I should say, to compare the invention that Eli Whitney had with the cotton gin to the production of cotton with the industrial roaster. I believe it was invented during the Civil War time period to the production of coffee. Is that any sort of fair comparison? Well, in a way it is. Jabez Burns was the man who invented the first really good industrial roasters. Before that, they had tried, but they were really unpleasant devices. They were almost torture because you had to open this hot roaster and shovel it all out. He invented a self-emptying roaster with a little screw that would let it come out. And so the Arbuckle brothers began to roast coffee in the period right after the Civil War. And because they couldn't keep it really fresh, the coffee, once you roast it, it begins to stale right away. So they had to somehow or other cope with that. And they put a egg and sugar coating on their coffee. And that really was the first coffee that was for sale all over the United States. They had little cartoonish coupons, beautifully lithographed that were collector's items, but also you could redeem them for various prizes and things like that. And so Arbuckle's coffee became incredibly important to people as the West expanded and the pioneers went there. And this led to many other coffee roasters beginning, such as Hills Brothers in San Francisco or Folgers also in San Francisco, which was started by the whaling family Folgers who when the whales were played out, went to make their fortune as very young teenagers. They managed to sail around Cape Horn and get to San Francisco, and they did not make their fortune from gold rush, but they did make it from roasting coffee for the miners. Chase and Sanborn began in the Boston area. You had Maxwell House beginning in Tennessee. So you began to have coffee being very important industrial product. The problem being that even though they learned to put them in vacuum-packed cans, Hills Brothers pioneered that, they were not able to pack it fresh because if they had, it would have exploded the can. Because coffee, when it's roasted, it begins to degas. It begins to let out carbon dioxide. And so it has this built-in time bomb to it. So in order to put it in a can which they started doing in the late 19th century, they had to let it go stale first. Mm. So that's been a problem for coffee ever since. The one-way valve bag has in part revolutionized that because you can now keep the coffee relatively fresh by bagging it right away, hopefully with a little flush of nitrogen gas or some inert substance. And then as it degasses, it goes out this little belly button looking thing that's on the bag of coffee. You can see that and it will let the air out, but it won't let it in. And so that will keep it relatively fresh for a fair amount of time. And that's how the specialty coffee industry has really developed. What is coffee cupping and how and when did that begin? Well, it probably began with Kills Brothers. They developed some fairly good taste in coffee. 
And it's kind of like with wine tasting. They would have a circular table. There's a picture of this in the book where they would take a specific amount of coffee, grind it, put it in hot cup, and then they would very, this is a big ritual, and they still do it this way. They break the crust of the coffee, which floats on the top, and very carefully skim off the coffee that's floating on the top. And then they will inhale it violently <laughs> and spray the coffee all over their palate at one time so that it hits all the taste buds. And then they will spit it out because if you drink it all day long, you get really over-caffeinated. It was an all-male industry. There was a lot of sexism built into the coffee industry from the very beginning. That was one of them. They wouldn't let women into the cupping room for a long time. Similarly, the worst jobs in the coffee-growing regions, the most tedious jobs, were sorting through the coffee beans to try to eliminate any of them that were broken or that had molded. So women would sit there and girls for hours at a time. Also, women were many of the primary harvesters. And there were women that I saw who were lugging these huge sacks of coffee. These were like Mayan Indians from up high in, in the Altiplano region, higher up than where coffee will grow. And they would come down for the coffee season and live in pretty bad conditions and work outrageous hours for a rather small amount of money. And, and they would have their children, you know, held on their front while they were doing this. And they also work children very hard. That's why during the coffee season, nobody goes to school still down there. Hmm. Regarding the medical concerns with coffee, that goes back a long ways. But I'd like to ask about C.W. Post and John Harvey Kellogg. And they created this non-coffee coffee, which sounds pretty terrible, actually. <laughs> well, John Harvey Kellogg and his brother started what we now know as Kellogg's, but it was a huge, they called it a sanatorium, the sand, in Battle Creek, Michigan, in the late 1800s. And he had all kinds of theories. He was a vegetarian. He thought coffee was terrible for you and made your nerves too raw. And he also thought that people had a kink in their intestines that you had to cut out in order to make them happier. And he was strange in many ways. But this fellow, C.W. Post, he had basically had a nervous breakdown because he was trying to make his fortune and was failing. And when he got to the sand, he was very impressed with their sort of coffee drink that was made out of grain, primarily barley and other grain that they would roast and sell as an alternative to coffee. So he made up his own version of it, which led to all kinds of strife with Kellogg. But he became very, very successful by having ads that attacked coffee. You know, they were pseudo-scientific ads that said, you know, that the pneumogastric nerve was affected by this. And if you drink coffee, you're going to fail in life and be pale and awful and <laughs> fall over dead. <laughs> and so he became a millionaire very quickly because of Postum and also grape nuts, which he invented. And he claimed basically that postum and grape nuts would make everyone better. He wrote a book called I Am Well, claiming that he was totally cured of all illnesses. Unfortunately, he developed what's probably appendicitis, and he was so distraught by this that he ended up committing suicide, mm -hmm. leaving his daughter, Marjorie Merriweather Post, with a huge amount of money. And she eventually helped to start General Foods and ended up buying Maxwell House. So that was kind of ironic <laughs> because the coffee people absolutely hated C.W. Post and they didn't know how to counter this. They really had pretty bad advertising. I was going to ask you about World War II. And of course, coffee has been a part of a soldier's diet going back to the Civil War, World War I, and then of course in World War II, is that when instant coffee is developed, and then does that affect the American coffee industry after that in the post-war era? Well, it did. Actually, instant coffee became popular during World War I also, but it was pretty bad stuff. They called it G. Washington coffee. It became very popular during the war, but then it sort of went away because it was such terrible stuff. 
by the time of World War II, Nestle had invented a superior method of creating instant coffee, which was Nescafe. Now, it still wasn't very good, but it was at least recognizably coffee. And you could just mix it with hot water. And if you could get hold of any kind of sweetener, it was extremely popular with the troops. So Maxwell House developed its own brand of, of this, Maxwell House Instant Coffee. And they got it included in, in the rations for the soldiers, so it became a very popular drink. And after the war, the coffee makers who were already making pretty lousy coffee, they realized that they could make this instant coffee with Robusta coffee. Now, I haven't talked about Robusta yet, but it also developed in Africa, probably beginning in uh, Ghana. And it's called Robusta because it grows more robustly. Arabica coffee, in general, grows best between 3,000 and 6,000 feet in elevation, but Robusta will grow much lower and under more humid conditions. The problem with it is it doesn't taste as good, and it has about twice as much caffeine in it, so it really packs a wallop, more of a wallop than you probably want. But because the instant coffee was pretty bad anyway, they began to add more and more Robusta to it, and Robusta became a, a popular item in the world, which it still is. Then they began to say, well, what the hell, we might as well add some quietly to our regular coffee as well. And they were in price wars with one another because coffee had become a commodity, which people were brewing it weaker and weaker because it tasted worse and worse. And they were also brewing it by percolating it, which is a, not a very good way to make coffee because you keep circulating hot water through and over extracting the beans and it becomes bitter and not so great to drink. So that was a disaster. The per capita consumption literally of coffee began to go down after 1946. The coffee people refused to admit this. They were too busy fighting one another for prices and trying to keep everything cheap and having coupon off sales in the newspaper and things like that. What happened is people began to drink it weaker and weaker and weaker. So you might be able to go into a diner and get a bottomless cup of coffee for 10 cents or something, but it was terrible coffee, <laughs> and they were using less and less of the grounds in it. So that by 1962, they had to admit that they had a real problem, that their sales were off, and they had what I consider to be sexist and, and terrible advertising in general, uh, which had started back in the 30s, where the husband is given coffee by his wife, and if the husband doesn't like it, he throws the hot coffee back on her or dumps it on top of her head <laughs> and says how awful it is. And she has to be a good little wife and learn how to make good coffee, which he condescendingly tells her, oh, this is really good. This is Maxwell House. Or, oh, this is really good. This is Chase and Sanborn. Oh, this coffee is criminal. Honey, you killed the petunias. Then you admit it. Your coffee really is murder. Papa Eddie, my coffee, it's murder. It's either too bitter or too weak. Try Folgers. Never bitter, never weak, always nice and rich. Because Folgers coffee is mountain grown. Mountain grown? Like the sign says, mountain grown for richer flavor. Mountains is where the best coffee comes from. Well, all right. You know, it's a crime not to have delicious coffee like this all the time. We will, now that I've discovered the mountains. Ooh. Folgers Coffee, mountain grown for richer flavor. At about the same time, Coca-Cola and Pepsi were eating their lunch because they were advertising, particularly Pepsi was advertising towards the young generation, the baby boomers, and the coffee people didn't know what hit them. And, you know, the coffee people would never have stooped to trying to be hip and trying to appeal to teenagers, for one thing, because everybody thought that coffee was terrible for teenagers, that it was bad for them and stunted their growth, whereas nobody seemed to think that about Coca-Cola or Pepsi. And Coke and Pepsi were using lifestyle ads 
and trying to appeal to people that this was a drink that would make you popular and sexy and athletic and all good things. And the coffee people just really had no clue. And so not only were they offering a worse and worse beverage, they were stodgy, they were sexist. Their attempts to appeal to the younger generation, they did try, but they were kind of ineffective and a joke. In the meantime, you had the price going up and down violently. And so you had the United States being willing to go into a, an arrangement with the coffee people to control the price of the drink as well as they could. And so they had a quota system that nobody ever liked because the Brazilians ended up having to burn coffee because they had too much of it. The other people were very bitter because they could only release a certain amount of their coffee. Then you had what you call tourist coffee, where people would smuggle it out to countries that weren't in the coffee agreement, and then they would sell that into the market. And so it was a mess, but it was it was interesting because it was one of the few times that the United States was willing to enter into some kind of price control agreement instead of totally free trade because they were afraid that Latin America and Africa would go communist if they allowed the price of coffee to go down too much, that it would be just this awful situation. So that eventually fell apart in 1989 as the Berlin Wall came down and the threat of communism ceased. The United States backed out of the international coffee agreement and the price of coffee collapsed in a dramatic and awful fashion. Then eventually the Vietnamese began growing lots of coffee by basically enslaving the mountain tribes, the mountain yards, who were trying to grow their own rotating traditional agriculture. They were dispossessed of their lands, and the Vietnamese began to grow huge amounts of primarily robusta and drove the world market down. There's so much to the story. It just goes on and on. It's amazing. That is, it's absolutely amazing. And you know, the stigma still is there. There's parents who will allow their children to drink Coke or Pepsi, but they wouldn't think of having their child drink coffee. It's supposed to be for an adult. So that stigma still is out there. Well, that's true. It's not true that it is terrible that I could figure out. It's funny because for a long time, as I said, that there were all these rumors that were started during the CW Post era, but even by 1980, there were all these epidemiological studies that appeared to indicate that coffee was perhaps behind birth defects, pancreatic cancer, heart attacks, all kinds of terrible things. And because of that, decaffeinated coffee began to surge in the late 70s and early 80s. Can the foods you eat affect the way you feel? Of course. That's why many people are serving their families Lean meats, fish, fresh salad, and coffee without caffeine. Sanka brand, decaffeinated coffee. In fact, last year, many doctors recommended Sanka brand by name to almost 4 million caffeine-concerned Americans like me. It's 100% real coffee. And after you take in that hearty aroma and full, fresh flavor, you'll wonder, what's all the fuss about the caffeine being gone? I love the taste. And now that I'm drinking Sanka brand, there's no caffeine to make me nervous or tense, and I really feel good. Yes, I think it's a good thing that people are more concerned about what they eat and drink without having to sacrifice good taste. Sanka brand decaffeinated coffee. It's the coffee you can feel good about. Eventually, those studies were proven to be flawed. Coffee does not cause pancreatic cancer. As a matter of fact, it turns out that coffee probably helps to prevent type 2 diabetes. People who drink coffee tend to commit suicide less. They tend to have less liver cancer. And so coffee has more and more gotten a cleaner bill of health. In my book, I advised that I thought that pregnant women should avoid it because it does go through to the placenta and it is an addictive drug. So it, it turns out to be an addictive drug that isn't really so horrible for you, but that's still arguable and people will argue about the impact of caffeine. And 
other items in coffee, it's got like 500 different chemical reactions that occur when you roast a coffee bean. So it becomes really quite a complex beverage, which is sort of akin to wine, depending on where it's grown and how it's roasted and how it's prepared, etc. So you have now all kinds of baristas and coffee nerds out there who are fanatical about how they make their coffee to the point that I think they sort of go overboard a lot of the time, but they, they certainly take it very, very seriously. There's a famous Simpsons episode where they go through every corner and there's a Starbucks on every corner. Could you explain the history of Starbucks and the development of the concept of the third place? Starbucks was actually begun by three guys, sort of young hippies. One was an English teacher. Jerry Baldwin, Zev Siegel, and Gordon Bowker. And they had been inspired by Alfred Peet, who was a Dutch immigrant who had been introduced to coffee by his father, who was sort of a, a guy he rebelled against and he fled. And he ended up in San Francisco, and he was disgusted by what had happened to the coffee industry. And he began to roast very dark and very strong coffee and served it in a coffee house in Berkeley, California, called Pete's in 1966. And he developed sort of a cult following of young, hip people who visited him and tried to learn at his feet as to what he was doing. And so that's these guys who, st who started Starbucks in the early 80s, or maybe late 70s, it might have been the late 70s, in Seattle. And they were very devoted to getting really high-quality Arabica beans, roasting them fresh, and then selling them to aficionados who would then grind it at home and have fresh coffee. But they didn't have the idea to serve the coffee. They just were roasting. And there were many little outfits like this. There was George Howell who had started doing this in Boston, and there were numerous people around the country who were beginning to rediscover the joys of real, fresh, roasted, and specially sourced coffee. Then one of their salesmen, Howard Schultz, he actually was selling plastic devices, and he couldn't figure out why this small firm, Starbucks, was buying so many of these devices. At any rate, he eventually joined Starbucks as one of their salespeople, and they sent him to a conference in Italy where he saw this sort of drama of baristas making espresso, which nobody really paid much attention to espresso at that point in the United States, except for some of the hippies in Greenwich Village. And so he thought, wow, this is so dramatic what they're doing. We should do this back in Seattle. And so he agitated for them to do this, and they were not very interested in it. And so he started something called Il Giornale, and eventually, to make a long story short, he ended up buying them out and inventing Starbucks as this espresso-based drink with lots of milk, so much so that people have accused them of basically being a dairy industry. <laughs> but he was phenomenally successful at doing this, and so beginning in the late 80s, he began to fanatically spread Starbucks that has been accused of doing all kinds of horrible things, and lots of people don't like Starbucks because it's sort of a cookie-cutter specialty approach, but they deserves a lot of credit for really rediscovering specialty coffee, and they really have done. They have their own coffee certification system, which has helped a lot of farmers who are willing to go along with whatever they, they want them to do, but they also have not supported they weren't supporting fair trade coffee, and they were given a lot of grief about that until they sort of were forced to begin to offer fair trade. Oh, you, you ask about the third place. Howard Schultz had read a book called The Great Good Place by Ray Oldenburg, a sociologist, who was lamenting the fact that we once had in the United States coffee houses where people could go to enjoy themselves. We once had soda fountains where people could go to enjoy themselves, where different generations could go. And he called it this third place. It wasn't home. It wasn't work. It was a place where you could go and not be drunk, because what we had were bars where people would get loaded. And by the way, 
coffee had really helped to sober Europe up. Until the coffee houses came along, the Europeans were drinking a huge amount of beer and hard liquor, and people were starting in the morning with that in large measure because it wouldn't give you any diseases, (laughs) and it gave you some kind of nutrition. So people would make beer soup and things like that. At any rate, the coffee began to sober everybody up. So basically, you come out of reading my book thinking that coffee is really not such a bad substance, that it's fascinating, and that it's now facing all kinds of difficulties because the industry has consolidated. Even the specialty places have been bought out by bigger places. You have constantly smaller places starting and trying to support good causes and having what they call direct trade with coffee growers. There's been a big movement to get the coffee growers to begin to learn cupping themselves. Women have become very expert cuppers, led by a woman named Erna Knudsen, who pioneered this back in the 80s. She fought her way into the men's cupping room. So it's got some wonderful characters and really interesting battles. There was also the whole battle with a guy named Hermann Sielken, who was a German who tried to control the coffee market back in the early 1900s by going into competition with the sugar maker consortium. And so they began to put out their own sugar. The other side began to put out their own coffee. And there was this huge pitch battle, which I covered in great detail. And Sealton started something called the valorization of coffee by trying to hold it off the market. And he was accused of manipulating the market. And then when World War One came along, he was in big trouble because he was German. There was all kinds of issues. In fact, there were Germans in the coffee industry during World War Two who really were Nazi sympathizers and others who weren't, but who were caught in between the U.S. government and the Nazis. So a lot of Germans were actually put in prison, German coffee farmers, during World War Two. People don't know about that. They know about the Japanese internments, but they were actually German internments, too. It's just amazing, Mr. Pendergrass. I mean, you, we've talked about several things, about revolution. You just mentioned Nazi sympathizers. Your book covers a ton of stories. So I want to thank you for your time today, and it's such a great book. Thank you again. Thank you so much for having me. I would like to thank my guest, writer and researcher Mark Pendergrast. And if you would like to get his book, Uncommon Grounds, The History of Coffee and How It Transformed Our World, just click on the link in the description below. From ancient Abyssinia to the advent of Starbucks, you will enjoy every story to the very last page. Our featured brew was Maple Breakfast Stout from the 14th Star Brewing Company of St. Albans, Vermont, Maple City, USA. If you enjoyed our talk today, please share this episode with a friend. And remember, as I mentioned before, subscribe to the podcast. It's the only way to get those new shows immediately, right when they're released. The music was provided by the North Carolina band Bones Fork. If you want to know what they have going on, just click on their link. It's in the description below as well. Once again, thank you to the listeners from around the globe. There are many more great episodes on the way. With discussions on the impactful congressional years of Stephen A. Douglas, D-Day Girls, and the crazy rock days of the big hair bands of the 1980s. So join us again next time when we talk, think, and drink on History of Go-Go. Hope you ain't the only one that belongs to a secret club. Your Aunt Bee's in one, too. Really? Mm-hmm. Aunt Bee? Yeah. You know what she is? She's keeper of the Sanka. <laughs> Sanka, the coffee that's made from a whole new blend of the world's finest coffees. And at the beginning of the meeting, the president says, B. Taylor, did you remember to bring the Sanka coffee? And A.B. says, <laughs> And the president says, B. Taylor, if you ever forget to bring new Sanka that's still 97% caffeine free, you know what'll happen. And A.B. says, Chris on the clock? You better know. So she always remembers to bring Sanka so the members can drink as much as they want, anytime they want. Wendy, what kind of a story is that to tell the boys? That's okay, B. I hear them stories have a week. <laughs> Try new sack. The coffee for folks who love good coffee and plenty of it. I appreciate it and good night.